So welcome John to the, the Lisa podcast. On the podcast we go inside addiction and talk about all things addiction. So if you wouldn't mind just having a little chat with us about how you sort of get to, got to where you are today and the journey you've sort of been on. Okay, Luke. Well, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation to join you today. And uh, hopefully what I have to share with you will be helpful to those who are watching or, or listening to, to this uh, very short podcast interview. My name is John, John Flaherty. Um, I live here in York in the north east of England, but I have traveled a lot, Luke. Um, although I, you know, for the most part, I've been here in England. I've lived in Ireland and a lot of years in Canada, too, and now back to England here. I've also traveled a lot. Uh, and particularly in the last few years traveled, um, but that's been more a case of, of sharing something I'll probably speak with you a little bit about today, and it would be about the message of a, a book I wrote just a couple of years ago. It's a book called Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free. Um, but really in all of those places, in England, in Ireland, in Canada, Luke, um, each time, you know, in each place, uh, I was always in the field of addiction, working in some capacity or other. Um, prior to going into that, I was a Catholic priest. Uh, so a very different start, you, you might think, to, to, to things. Um, so the, the whole of the spiritual side of things was always very important to me. But when I left the priesthood, it, was, it felt very right for me to do that. It was to expand. It was to expand myself primarily. Uh, I had felt you know, considerably confined in that world of, of religion. Um, but the spirituality remained very, very important and essential to me. I, I then had to really discover, well, what on earth do I do with my life? You know, I, I was really only trained and primed for that. Um, a lot of years spent studying all the things like philosophy and theology and the scriptures and years and years of, of training. And even after the 11 years as a priest, I, I then had to think, well, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really equipped for anything else. I realized that wasn't really the case because in no time I first of all found myself working in the field of HIV and AIDS. And uh, in those days, I'm talking now about the early 90s, it was still, you know, something that people very much feared and still something that we knew relatively little about. Um, so I was a bit of a pioneer in that field in a sense. And I learned a huge amount about HIV AIDS, but it was also an introduction to me to the whole world of addiction. Because a lot of people accessing the center where I worked were people maybe uh, who were homeless, a lot of people who had been working the streets, maybe in prostitution, and inevitably a lot of those became dependent on alcohol and in, and in injecting drugs or taking you know, drugs of whatever kind in order just to get by. Um, both in the earlier years when I was a Catholic priest and then even so in those years, although I was now fairly well trained and well knowledgeable about HIV AIDS, I still knew very little about addictive behaviors. Uh, so it was a real eye opener to me and I learned a huge amount mainly by just listening to people without judging, just really listening carefully to all the different stories, to the different backgrounds to the different life experiences that each individual was prepared to share with me. It's a time of, of real learning, real discovery for myself. So much so that it, it really encouraged me to want to deliberately further my studies uh, in that whole world of addiction. And it was at that time that I moved to Ireland. I was living in Dublin most of that time. And in Dublin, um, again, in those years, they were experiencing what, what really they described as a heroin epidemic. It was, it was a huge thing that really, you know, very much devastated families across much of, of the city of Dublin and throughout other parts of Ireland. And it was a good time for me, in the sense, to really learn again so much more about addiction and treatments and the whole process of recovery. It was an exciting time in a sense because the Irish people at that time were very willing to experiment. I put a lot of money, a lot of backing into the various projects. And I took up the role there as the, um, the, the, the manager, the coordinator of a, a multidisciplinary team. I had a marvelous team of people who were working with um, 
professionals who were doctors or nurses, but they were a team of people who were really prepared to, to get to know people at grassroots, work within the community. And um, all the time addressing not only those who were in addiction, but their loved ones, people who were really concerned, people who were also very frightened and fearful about the various forms of addiction that people were, you know, their loved ones were getting into, but simply also not knowing what to say, how to cope with it, how to deal with it, how to do anything, in fact, in that rather helpless situation. So that was my kind of starting place there. And um, I studied. I went to Trinity College in Ireland, in Dublin, and studied a, an excellent uh, master's degree there, all about uh, addiction and treatment and recovery and, and, and how to advance the, the whole experience of people's lives as they wanted to transition that time in their life. Um, from there, it took me to Canada, and again, all of the time, I was, I was staying within that field of addiction, but taking on various roles, working from street level, community level, and sometimes even working with what would be thought of the, the more high-end bracket of, of people, celebrities and the likes who are accessing um, a, a private rehab center. But, you know, look, in, in any of those cases, no matter what was the, the scenario, wherever I was working, people whatever their background or whoever, however famous or unfamous they were, were actually still presenting for the very same needs. And it wasn't just about wanting to overcome their drinking habit or their use of a particular drug or their difficulties with eating disorders or gambling or any of those things, not just that alone, but right at the heart of it, it was always about an individual knowing in their heart and soul that there must be more to life than was their current experience. They just knew that, but they didn't have the ways of articulating it. They didn't have the, the person to give them the affirmation and the validation that, yeah, there is, you know, there's a huge amount more to you than what you've been experiencing. And that became more and more the role that I started to take up. It was very, very much in keeping with where I'd started in the spiritual field, realizing that, of course, we're so much more, each of us are so much more than who we've come to think we are. And we're so much more than other people think we are too. And that discovery, that journey to discovery of who we really are, that I, that I really believe and what has prompted me to write the book I have written to, to really help people to go, and to discover what that truth is over the lie that they've been telling themselves or that other people have been telling them about themselves. And it opened up a whole new world, so much so that I realized I was teaching a very different kind of message and a one that was very, very much needed and which people were, were eager to hear and eager to listen to and began to respond to far more readily and far more easily. Does that help, Luke? Does that kind of give you a quick background to yeah, that does, what yeah, I need to do, basically, what I'm doing today? Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting journey and a really um, sort of nice way to, to get into helping people with addiction. But you said there that everyone that you met, whether they were famous or not famous, um, wanted to solve the same needs. How would yeah. you describe those needs? The, the, the deep desire, I think, is always there. You may know this. I don't know your own background. I don't know if you've had experience with, with addiction yourself. Look, I'm, I'm kind of presuming you, you may have. Um, in, you know, in a sense, I'd go as far as to say that every person has some form of addicting. I know that's a, not <laughs> really a real word, but we're always addicting to something. We always know that there must be more. There's something more that I'm not ex yet experiencing, but it's there, it's a knowing. Yeah, I was, um, sorry to stop you, but I was listening to um, something earlier about mindfulness and the person in there said we're even addicted to busyness. We can't even be with our own thoughts. So I think even yeah. addiction goes down to that sort of level where we have to be listening to the radio or on our phone or something like that. But yeah, continue. I really think we are all addicted in some way. It's very much that. It's, it's a striving. And, it, you know, it's a very beautiful and natural and important striving because, in fact, we are so much more than the very limited way that we've been conditioned 
or programmed to accept about ourselves. Now, that's some more than others. Put it this way, Luke, you know, maybe, maybe in part answer to your question. When a, little, when a newborn child, a baby, comes into the world, um, it's, it's amazing to watch a newborn and their form of development because they don't have a language. They don't have thoughts so or they don't have language yet. Therefore, they don't have a concept. They don't have concepts. Uh, they haven't discovered anything like that. They don't know a, a you as opposed to a me or a over there as opposed to over here. None of that actually really exists for them. But what they do have are 10 billion neurons busily kind of working away like crazy, developing a neural network of information, of data, of stimulus going on. And actually, within the first two years of any child's life, 1.8 million of these synapses are being perf being formed per second. That's kind of incredible, isn't it, to think that's the, ra the rapidity of a, a child's development. And it's there because everything is new. Everything's exciting. The child itself is new to the home and to the environment. Everybody wants to see the newborn child. You know, they're always kind of looking in. Oh, isn't she lovely or isn't he lovely? He looks just like his father or just like his mother or whatever. You know, and there's all that stimulus going on. But then there's something rather disastrous happens. And this is in every child because just within another two years, so that's by about the age of four, it's a kind of a mass culling, a, 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 a literally a, a death of as many as 50% of those neurons or synaptic junctions that have been formed in the brain. And that's simply because no longer is the child the new kid on the block. You know, they're already getting used to the child being there, so the stimulus isn't as great. And the child's information development in its neural network of synapses begin to break away. It's called a pruning away of that network of intelligence. If you think of a child who's grown up in an environment where there is maybe a lot of alcoholism, where there's a lot of shouting, where there's a lot of disharmony, where there's a lot of ignoring of the child, where there isn't enough attention, can you see, therefore, how much more the child's synaptic neural network would be even more diminished and even less? And so we begin to form a reality, no matter where we are on that spectrum, depending on how well or how less well that network is developed, that's how we think reality to be. You know, it's either marvelous or wonderful, and every possibility under the sun exists, but more often it's a case of don't do this and don't do that. And I can't do this and I can't do that. This is wrong if you do this and don't step out of line if you do that. And individuals, every one of us, becomes so much less than we actually really are. It's been really my only joy and my only duty in all the work that I've done and still do today, now working with people all over the world, really, through, through Skype like we're doing today, is to, to teach people a different message, first and foremost about their very self. And I say self, meaning a big capital S, self, not the small, limited version of how we've learned to become, but the truth of who we really are, the truth without any of that limitation, any of that smallness, any of that programming, any of that conditioning has kept us feeling less than. Because it's when we feel less than that we strive for truth again. We strive for more. We know we want to make our way back to the source. The source that just sources everything. And I just simply call that life. I know some people prefer to call it God. And certainly in my religious past, I would have done it one time. But I've realized that that too has got its own connotations that can put a lot of people off. And it puts a lot of people off if they've had a bad experience of what they've been taught, even about God. Some people use the term a higher power. And I don't tend to use that either because 
that can also seem as though it's, it's something outside of us. It's a little bit beyond us. And that's not really a truth either. More to the, more to the truth is, it's life itself that literally has no agenda. That's just breathing us without us even having to try. It's lifing us. In this moment, it's lifing you, Luke. It's lifing me. And so we're having this conversation. And when we come to accept that, we realize, of course, we can never, ever be disconnected from it. Never. It's not possible to be disconnected from the source of life that's constantly sourcing us. When we begin to make a friend of that, everything changes. A whole different perspective and a perception about life changes. It no longer becomes the hostile universe that we were maybe introduced to. It becomes a far more friendly one, a far less unsafe one to be able to continue like a child to go and want to explore and to experiment with and to be the creators of with far more confidence. It's when a person's lack that, that of course they seek it through other means. Alcohol is the most obvious one because it's the most readily available one. But there are all kinds of other ways too by which we want to, often enough, just numb the pain of being kept so small because it's not our natural birthright. We're meant to expand and to grow and to make present our very unique individual selves. So, so really, that, that would be the core message not only is the book I've written, might as well show it to anybody that's maybe watching the little um, uh, uh, program here if they can see it. But it's, um, it's this book here. It's Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free. And it's, it's deliberately written as an easy-to-read book. Look, I, I think you have read it yourself, actually, and hopefully you found it to be, well, probably very different to, you know, most books on addiction, which can sometimes be a bit heavy going, can't they? And a, sometimes even a bit depressing, really. Yeah. Th this book is actually really about how very magnificent every addict that I've ever had the privilege to work with is a very magnificent being. In fact, I think I would go as far as to say that I've possibly enjoyed, if that's the right word, I've certainly found it more of a privilege to work with the people who are in addiction more than anyone because I've realized that they usually more than anyone else, or most people else, are the ones more ready to go and discover the more about themselves. It's actually been part of what their addiction has been about, strangely enough. It's been an exploration. It's been a, sometimes a desperate exploration to find the something else. They've usually just stopped off at either the spirit in the bottle or the, you know, the, the high of the drug rather than just taking it a little bit more deeply and discovering, no, it's, it's actually about reclaiming the fullness or the completeness of the truth about your very self. And that's very, very exuberating indeed when you, when you reclaim it, when you discover it, when you make it your own. It's, it's, it's a return to the norm of the creator. It's a kind of giving your little self back to the truth of yourself. And, um, I've got to say, look, that, you know, once I started to have the confidence enough to recognize that about myself and then to be able to share and to teach it and to inspire it in other people, men and women, you know, were, were literally at the end of their seat wanting to, to hear a bit more. You know, John, tell us a little bit more. This is great. You know, why, why weren't we taught this at school, people would say. Why, why you know, it didn't come from my parents. It certainly didn't come from teachers. It didn't come from religions. Why am I only hearing it now? And it, it is sad that, that people sometimes have to go to desperate measures before they hear a real truth being spoken, but it shouldn't be so. And part of the reason I've written the book is to make a message, hopefully as widely heard, that is different to the one that people are more readily hearing, which is usually about having to fight or overcome their addictions, or battle with their addictions, or, you know, even using those terms, it's such, it seems such hard work, you know, and, and I'm sure, the, well, there is, from my, my experience, tells me there is a much easier way, it's by softening the heart, surrendering a little of our ego, and actually handing over to the divine, 
to the expansion that we we are by by nature, but we've just forgotten to remember it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I see it as a lot as you know, sort of becoming my best self, and like you say, shredding away a lot of the bad programming and stuff, um, and really, yeah, connecting to who I am. And I think a lot of people, if they go through traditional messages like methods of recovery, they kind of change through desperation. Whereas I think there's a much in- more interesting way of changing through inspiration and being more inspired to become your best self. And like you say, discover, don't understand that your dependency is merely a stop off on the way to discovering your true self. And it doesn't have to end there. Absolutely. Yeah, I love what you're saying, Luke. I think it's it's so important that people really hear that message. You know, over the years, I've worked in all kinds of different kind of different levels and also in different kind of approaches to addiction. But, you know, a, a recurring thing that I would have seen happening, sadly, is that sometimes even counsellors, they can be very punishing, you know, they can be uh, quite almost brutal in their approach to a person in recovery, because it, almost presenting the, um, the falsehood that somehow they know what it is to, to reach this point of achievement, and the person in addiction hasn't got there yet, you know? And it's, it's too big a climb for somebody to think that they need to make. I, I'm convinced it's nothing to do with that at all. It's far more a, a discovery from within about your very precious self, about honouring it, learning how to honour it, learning how to actually ex- expand it, be confident and to allow it to become the presence that you truly are. And um, as I say, you know, I, I, wrote the, I wrote the book really after a lot of years of having the privilege of teaching, uh, you know, meeting in group and teaching on a daily basis those who were in recovery. And often enough people are saying, you know, why don't you get this new book, John? And for a long time I, I put off uh, and thought, well, you know, it's a book's a book. But I'm pleased that eventually... I did actually put pen to paper, so to speak, let the book happen. And it wrote itself very quickly because it was really just a a book of all the different things that had come about over a number of years. There are some great testimonies in that book, if you've read it, Luke, of very ordinary people who were on that, like you're saying, that pro- process of self-discovery and self-awareness and self-empowerment that brought them to a very different understanding of themselves and you know within two years the book that I thought was just going to be helpful maybe to a group of people was was uh, picked up by different people who wanted to translate it in different language and it's now available in English in Romanian in German in Spanish and in Polish you know I, I couldn't have imagined that there would have been that kind of eagerness to read this message but on the other hand you know, I know it's it's a valuable and very very worth worthy message to be making available to people, and it's obviously being very well received. So, I'm delighted that we're having this conversation today because those who are watching or listening, hopefully, will look for the book uh, and, and find for themselves that there may be something very different, very new for themselves to be able to pick up and to be able to build on. You'll yeah, find it amazing. very very natural i think yeah and it's amazing that you've had such a widespread audience but if for a second we can try and get like a bit practical we've been talking about this place of um finding and discovering yourself but one Mm. thing that really helped me or or that scared me at first was if i go and develop this self-awareness or look inside there's bad stuff there and the reason i'm using this substance is to hide from that bad stuff but something practical that i guess i would tell my addicted self would be that in therapy, it's non-judgmental. And I think when you unwrap your demons, if you want to call them that, or the bad parts of yourself that you drink to forget, um, in a non-judgmental environment, and another person accepts those bad qualities or bad things, uh, or bad memories or trauma, then you start to forgive yourself for that. And you start to become less dependent um, because you're forgiving yourself from that self-awareness. And then you can start to grow from that. But what sort of practical bits of advice would you give to sort of develop that um, in our confidence? Yeah, okay, look, it's a very good question, and I'm pleased that you've asked it. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I'm just coming to the end 
of a second book, okay? And it, it's, it's almost happened as naturally as the first one because it's about the very thing that you're talking about. It's about guilt. Guilt. Guilt is a real killer, or can be, if we let it absolutely overwhelm us. And it sits at the base, you know, at the fa underneath all addictive behaviors. And I'm sure that's the very thing that you're, you're expressing as you speak to me there. And then the shame that follows on from it. And so we're always, what you're, what you're describing as those bad feelings or those bad memories or those bad traumas or those bad whatevers, you know, bad programmings. They're the ones that actually have left us feeling less worthy. Less worthy just to take up our natural space in this life. And, you know, guilt is such a lie. It's a lie about life. Um, I know that might sound a, a, a peculiar way of putting it, but it is. It's a lie about life. We can always feel regret about something. We can always feel, you know, that we could have done something or would have liked to have done something in a different way or said something or thought something. But to accommodate guilt as if it were a life sentence, there's something uncanny about that. You know, it's a strange, strange phenomenon, guilt. People have often described it as being one of our emotions or just part of your conscience. But I, I, the more I look at it, I realize that it, it affects every one of our emotions and it affects our conscience, but it's very much an imposed thing. It's something about the principles that people in some authority, and an authority can be any person that we've given that authority to, a parent, a partner, the government, a religion, you name it, always looking outside of ourselves, even to a higher power, a God, a something out there rather than inside, where we're still looking for the permission just to be at ease with ourselves. Do you know, in truth, if we had have known some of those things, been more aware of some of those things at a time when we weren't aware of some of those things, then we wouldn't have behaved in the way that we're now behaving, would we? You know, but we can really hurt ourselves by thinking, I should have done different and I could have done different. Well, do you know what? We couldn't have done any different and we wouldn't have done any different. And in fact, what part of what made us act and think and do as we did, that we're maybe still feeling so wrecked about now and that we go and maybe to drink in order to hide from or to use drugs in order to quell the pain. That's part of the way that we can deal with it. And the other is to look at this thing called guilt, about how we think we could have done it in a different way, and ask ourselves, is that really true? Is it really true that I could or would have done anything different? Or was I simply not equipped to do so? Was I not even meant to be equipped to do so then? And why on earth would I be keeping this terrible pain going in me when clearly life itself isn't doing that to me? You know, even the most hardened criminal, Luke, the person who's maybe done all kinds of dreadful acts and is maybe serving very long life sentences in jail, do you know, life itself is still life in that individual. It's still breathing them into life. They still have to wake up next morning time. So it's not life that's actually got any agenda. It's not life that's actually wanting to keep them feeling perpetually punished for something that they didn't feel resourced enough to do differently earlier on. We've really got to change the mindset of that. They're all about principles that have been set for us. And the trouble with principles is that they lack sensitivity. They don't really home into the individual and think, of course you would have behaved like that, given that this was your situation, this was your state of mind, this is how limited your resources were. So the need for self-forgiveness, which you mentioned there, Luke, yeah, I can't agree with you more. And self-forgiveness, really, is just understanding, coming to a different understanding that you were not equipped with earlier and perhaps now 
out of a greater conscious awareness you've come to. Sometimes that awareness can come to you as a result of having to serve long time imprisonment or in jail, but it doesn't have to be that that hard either. It can come to you by actually dropping the lie about life that we've sometimes tried to accommodate that really belongs to somewhere and to something else and just be more accepting of the fact that if life isn't judging us, why on earth would we be judging and hurting ourselves to the extent that we are? Life's always wanting us to wake up and realize that's who I was. I was and now I am this and this is how it is and how it is is definitely not how I was. You know, life is changing all of the time and we've got to realize that we change with it. It's just, that's how it is. That's just how it is. It's a very beautiful thing. Life does not judge. But human beings are terrible at judging. And as a result, you know, where people have left off judging ourselves, we tend to take up and start doing it to ourselves. And that's the thing that we've really got to learn how to interrupt. You're asking, how do we do that? It's by listening to a different message. It's, it is really why I'm writing books and why I'm speaking to people. It's why I'm speaking in this interview today. It's why people can contact me if they wish after this interview or sometime if they want to further it with me because it's a, it's a teaching process. It's a learning, a discovering how to do differently our way of life to the way that we've been taught or shown or to the way that we thought was the only way of trying to do it. And it doesn't have to be the struggle that we've come to think of it as being. Yeah, that's really amazing. And how would you say we sort of, if the people around us almost impact how we feel about ourselves, and if we have low self-worth and we like are addicted to substances, how do we sort of remove that low self-worth and increase it? And also stop worrying about what people think around us, because that's almost part in for like to to, to like, bring on the guilt as well. Yes, I think when, when when you contacted me, you said there was a particular chapter in my book which you found most helpful, and I think it was that very chapter. I think the chapter was called something like um, "When you woke up this morning, how did you know to be you?" Right, and and the and the, the chapter basically simply explains that. You know, we, we get up each morning time and we go straight into our programming depending on where we left off the, the night before. Whatever our thoughts were about ourselves the night before, we just go into autopilot and we start reenacting. Once we become aware of that, we realize that we are just going into autopilot mode. Just It's a learned behavior. And we need to be shown how to unlearn it. Part of the unlearning of that is to realize that if there are some of those people in our lives who are really insisting that we keep ourselves so incredibly limited, maybe it's time to say, you know, a little bye-bye to some of those people. It is okay to let them go. It is okay to release people with such negativity and with, with who have maybe held such small um, respect or, or lack of any kind of respect for our precious selves. You know, it's not as if the person who's not in addiction has not had similar thoughts. And it's not as though the person who's not addicting in the same way has not got as much to discover and to learn about themselves. But one of the things that I would have seen often when I was working in treatment and rehab uh, programs of one kind or another would be an individual so like yourself, who would turn up and be really committed and ready to want to change their habitual pattern of dependency on alcohol or drugs particularly. They would be doing really well. They would have gone through their detox program. They would have been listening to the very much message that I'm sharing with you today, thriving on it, raring to go in good company, starting to look after themselves, feed themselves well, get a little bit more exercise, change their routine, they'd be in a different environment. And lo and behold, they would crumble at the thought of it being weekend where family could come and visit them in their rehab center. You know, they would get all fearful. Why? Because the first thing that family would want to know is, are you fixed yet? You know, are you OK yet? Do you think we might be able to like you again now that you're sorted? You know, we're an awful mentality. And of course, it was enough, often enough, 
to, to take the, the individual straight back to square one. It's too big a jump there. What, what family can do, an awful lot more than perhaps they realize they can do, is to recognize that they also are undergoing life's invitation to them just as much as it is to the individual who's struggling with their own addiction to also grow and to expand past their judgment, you know, past their criticism. It's often enough it would be a terrible thing to see somebody who would maybe work really hard to overcome their drinking. Uh, and the first thing family would want to do is celebrate with them, and the rest of the family would all open up the cans of beer and open up, you know, and expect the other poor soul to, to not be wanting to join in the same thing. You know, people aren't thinking. People aren't respecting. It's a, it's a learning process for everyone. When there's addiction in a family, it's an invitation from life for every family member to discover the more about themselves. And in answer to your question, what can we do individually about that? Well, when people are really not cooperating or assisting us, it's maybe time for us, first and foremost, to let them go or to certainly not be as dependent upon them as we once thought we were. You know, we maybe have to close that one. And, and make sure that what we actually do advocate, what we do do to ourselves, is something that actually in turn becomes more attractive to them also to do something about their own changes and their own development, their own expansion of elements about their own life that, of course, life is always inviting each of us to do. It's, you know, it's, that's why I'm saying I, I really love the privilege of working with those in addiction because life doesn't really ask of individuals to take on this route of addiction if it doesn't know that they haven't got an immense amount also to shine through and to teach others as they go. And I believe that's what you're doing, setting up you know, the, your podcast as you are. You're actually introducing people to a much broader view of life itself, to other options and other possibility. And I think it's great, Luke, that you, you're doing. And I really wish you well and you continue. And I do thank you for... Uh, involved in me as part of this today because it is about pushing out the boundaries changing our perception about life itself and of the limitation that we've all been very fearful and frightened to actually not step out of and be more true to ourselves in um, keep that going as well as you can uh, as indeed is my is, has become my own kind of life's journey now to to teach and to encourage and to just show people, you know, there's another way. There's another way. And it doesn't have to be hard and punishing. In fact, it's far better understood when it's loving and understanding and compassionate. And certainly when it's forgiving. Yeah, well, we are coming to the end now. But it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you well, very much. Is there any sort of final words or anything you'd like to add? No, you, you, you're very, very welcome. Uh, when I'm talking about... The book, look, it's it's not just to plug the book for me to make a whole load of money out of it. Believe you me, I, I definitely don't. It's a self-published book. But but I would like people who are listening, if anything I've shared with you even remotely resonates with them, then it's good for them to know that the book's available. It, 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 any book shop will, will be able to get it for them, but it's most readily available on Amazon, amazon.com, amazon.co.uk. And just again, for, for those who are listening, the book's called Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free. And um, alternatively, if people want to make a connection with myself personally, they're welcome to do that. And the website for me would be BeAwareBeAlive.com. So that's www.BeAwareBeAlive.com. And I'm kind of more than ready to be of whatever personal assistance I can be to anyone that maybe feels the need for that. Sometimes it's the person in addiction. More often enough, it can be the person who is close to them, family member who also just simply needs some assistance, some guidance, a little bit of direction. Um, so that's it, Luke. Now, and again, I just congratulate you on the work that you're doing, and uh, well done. Well thank done, you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming on the show.